All right, so this is a continuation of the analytic approach to limits for Monday the 14th, and I believe we're on letter J here, uh, which has a typo actually. So we're going to rewrite it first. I'll grab my black pen. We're gonna take the limit as X approaches zero of one over X plus two. I'm gonna, just a second, my, just I had to prop up my iPad, my, wrist kept hitting it. So, and then minus one half all over X. That's our new and improved letter J. I'm gonna have you star this one. Um, and when we star them, it means I'm testing you on one just like it. Um, that just reminded me we're doing a formative quiz on Thursday. I have to throw one of these on there. I forgot to. I think I hit all the other kinds though. So, um, here we go. So the problem with this one is upon direct substitution, which is always the very first thing you do, I got that indeterminate form zero over zero. That does not mean the limit doesn't exist. Um, it doesn't mean it's zero. It means it needs more work. You need to play with it. It means something's going to cancel. We actually know what's going to cancel because there's an X in the denominator causing a zero. So there's got to be a factor of X in the numerator. We just don't see it when it's in this form. So with complex fractions, the first thing you're going to need to do is get rid of them. And the easiest way I think for us, so we're going to retake the limit as X approaches zero, but we are going to subtract these fractions. And the easiest way to add and subtract fractions that don't share any multiples in the denominator is to do what I call crisscross multiply across, which over the years, kids have turned into crisscross applesauce. So you go to the top left and you multiply and get a two. Then you take the link with you. This will be a subtraction. And then you go to the top right. So top left, link, top right. You multiply um, one times X plus two. I hope my washing machine noise isn't coming through on this recording. I, uh, the laundry is going in the room adjacent to this one and it's making a lot of noise on the spin cycle. Anyway, I'm going to repeat. We do Chris minus cross, and then we do what I call applesauce, which is to multiply across. That's a pretty slick way for cleaning up a fraction. Now, just a second. Suppose it had been like 11 thirteenths minus 2 fifths. It works for this as well. Um, you would do 55 minus 26 all over 13 times 5, which is 65 and you would just end up with a 29 over 65. It's super slick um, for adding and subtracting fractions. So back to this original one, we took care of the numerator, but it's all still divided by X. And remember when we divide, we multiply by a reciprocal. So when I multiply by the reciprocal of this X right here, I'll be multiplying by one over X. And so really what happens is it collapses as a product in the denominator. So I'm gonna repeat, because normally we would have had a full day of complex fractions had I done um, our full algebra review. But I, I, again, I'm trying to be cautious with time because with this hybrid system and if we eventually go distance learning, I don't know how far behind we're gonna get. So, so I'm just inserting some of that review I usually do in as we need it. So I'm gonna repeat. To clean up this complex fraction, we go Chris cross. That's two, and that's x plus two. When we multiply on the crisscross, we take the link with, we take the link with, we multiply across on the denominator. So crisscross multiply across, crisscross applesauce, and then it collapses as a product. So that x ends up being in the denominator. Now, when I clean this up, limit as x approaches zero of, on the top, the two and the minus two will cancel when you distribute this in but we'll end up with a negative x over 2x times x plus two. I just found my issue. I'm going to cancel it off. I knew I had to. Um, and that leaves me with a negative one over two times x plus two. Now, I purposely dropped my limit to show you for notation. You would lose um, what's called a linkage point on this uh, because you dropped your limit. So make sure you keep that limit going with it until you replug, and it goes all numerical. So kind of keeping your head, if ever there's any variables in it, you need a limit in front of it. 
So this would be negative one over two times two or negative one fourth. So one last repeat of that cleaning up of a complex fraction. If you had two over x plus um, three over x plus one all over x minus two, that's a complex fraction. To clean it up, you'd go Chris, two times x plus one plus plus cross three x all over multiply across x times x plus 1, and then it'll collapse on the bottom as a product, okay? And then you clean it up. All right, and we did those, we did those. We're off to this guy right here. It says find the limit as h approaches 0 out, and this one's getting a star. This is a really important um, expression for us coming up in our next unit, so... Um, Stay tuned. <laughs> so let's do uh, f of x plus h. So f of x plus h. The function f takes 2, multiplies it by whatever you're putting in squared. In this case, x plus h is going in. Minus 3 times whatever's going in. In this case, x plus h. And then it's got a plus 4 on it. That's f of x plus h. Okay? That's um, this guy right here but I need to subtract f of x. So if I went minus f of x, I need to subtract f of x, which is 2x squared minus 3x plus 4. Divide the whole thing by h, and I need to take its limit. Okay, so all I did was plug x plus h into the f machine. And then I subtracted f of x, and I'm dividing by h. So now I'm going to clean this up. Where am I here? All right. Uh, so to clean this up, I have to expand the x plus h squared by foiling. So that would be x squared plus 2xh. On the outside is xh. Inside is xh. So when you foil that, h squared. There's a 2 in front of it. Minus 3x minus 3h, and I distribute this in, just a bunch of algebra, 1, plus 4, plus 4, minus 2x squared, plus 3x, minus 4, all over h. Now remember, go back to the original expression up here, which is kind of messy. When I initially plug, um, 0 in for h, I get f of x minus f of x over 0. So I know h is my issue in the denominator causing a 0. I know it must live in the numerator as a factor. It, it has to cancel whenever you get that 0 over 0. So watch what happens. The 2x squared will cancel with the minus 2x squared, right? And then the minus 3x cancels with the plus 3x. The plus 4 cancels with the minus 4. You see all that? So what's left on the top is the 2x squared got wiped out is a 4xh plus 2h squared, right? Minus the 3h, minus the 3h, and everything else was gone. And again, that minus 3h came from in here. It's all over h, and it's a limit as h approaches 0. Now I'll factor the h out of the top. Whenever you have this expression right here, you're going to be able to get rid of all non-h terms. Notice everything that didn't have an h in it down here, canceled off. Didn't have an h in it, didn't have an h in it, didn't have an h, didn't have an h, didn't have an h. Everything without an h canceled off. And so now I'm able to factor that h out of the top. So I didn't leave much room here on the bottom and it's not letting me scroll. So I'm going to erase this so as not to run out of space. All right, so on the top, again, I'm not dropping that limit until I don't see any variables. I'm gonna factor the h out. It's a limit as h approaches zero of, where did the four x h come from? Oh, that's right, okay. Sorry, I was just being a nerd. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll fa factor the h out and we get a 4x. And then we get plus 2h, and then we get minus 3 all over h. Cancel, cancel, 
Now the zero goes in 4h, can drop my limit, and I will have 4x minus 3 left over. Uh, kind of cool. Um, super important for something to come. All right. So next up, we have to tackle this absolute value issue. We're getting, we're getting a lot in this section, but tomorrow's a work day. So if I ask kids, what's the absolute value of x? A lot of times they'll say, well, it's a distance from zero. They'll say, yep. They'll say it's always positive. They'll say, yep, but what is it as an equation? Then usually what I get is kids say, well, it's x. And I'd say, well, what if x was negative three? The absolute value of negative three isn't negative three. It's the opposite of negative three. So the absolute value function is really a piecewise function. It is itself as long as itself is positive. But it's the opposite of itself when it is negative. So graphically, the reason it makes that V is it pieces together the line Y equals X and Y equals negative X. And it looks like a V, it's not a V, it's two lines that are meeting together. So it says sketch the graph using the formal definition I just did. So remember F of X is the absolute value of X, F of X is Y. So Y equals X, so the absolute value of X is itself, as long as we're positive, it's the opposite of itself when it's negative. So it becomes piecing together those two lines. Now it says write 2X minus five as a piecewise function. Well, that split occurs at the vertex or where those two lines meet, which is what makes the absolute value equal to zero. So the first thing you're going to do is say, well, where is that equal to zero? And you're gonna say at five halves. So what that means is at two and a half, one, two, three, at two and a half, that's where um, the uh, vertex of the V is. Now to the right, we're going to be positive to the left, it's going to be negative, all right? So when I write it as a piecewise function, I would say this, f of x is equal to itself, just like over here, itself, as long as the stuff in the absolute value bars is greater than or equal to zero or is positive. But in this case, it was five halves where the split was. It's the opposite of itself when x is less than five halves. And you can see it makes the opposite, it would be the graph of negative two x plus five versus the graph of two x minus five. So again, if you had f of x equaling the absolute value of x minus three, it is x minus three, as long as x is greater than or equal to three. Otherwise, like when x is a two, right? Then it's the opposite of that. So it's the opposite of itself when x is less than three. So all absolute value functions are really piecewise functions. So this is going to be a very, kind of a new um, parent function for us, this absolute value of x over x. Um, its graph isn't what you would think it is. Now when I put in the zero over zero, I mean the zero, I get zero over zero. What I know is that doesn't necessarily mean that the answer is zero or that it doesn't exist. It means we need more work. Remember for a limit to exist, we have to get to the same place when we come in from the left as we come in from the right. Well, using the formal definition, right? The absolute value of X will be itself as long as we stay to the right of zero. Absolute value of eight is eight. Absolute value of 99 is 99. Absolute value of one is one, but the absolute value of negative three is three. So when X is positive, I mean negative, we need to take its opposite. So now what happens is, graphically for this guy, to the right of zero, I'll just have X over X, which is one. At zero, it's undefined, so I actually need to, um, Oops, my phone's ringing. I'll be right back.
Sorry, guys. I was getting a um, phone call, and I have one of my kids in the military, and only gets to call on Sundays sometimes. So I oh, had to go get it, but it turned out it was a stupid automated call. So back here, hopefully, fast forward through all the blank space. <laughs> all right. So where was I? Absolute value of x over x will be one everywhere to the right of zero. Watch. I'll go grab my trusty yellow pen here. Go to the right of zero. Let's say at seven. What's the absolute value of seven over seven? One. What's the absolute value of nine over nine? One. What's the absolute value of 0 0.01 over 0 0.01? One. Everywhere it's going to be one. But the minute I have a negative number, then this becomes the opposite of x. And the opposite of x over x is negative one. Or just go test it out. Let's go erase so you can see more clearly what I have going here. If I go anywhere, again, if I approach zero from the right, I'm choosing numbers over here. If I approach from the left, let's go way out to the left. Maybe when x is negative 10, I would have the absolute value of negative 10, which is 10, over negative 10. Notice I get negative one. Let's go maybe negative 11. Well, the absolute value is 11 over negative 11. I get, no matter what I pick to the left of zero, I will always have an output of negative one. So the graph with these absolute values um, always have, when it's the absolute value of something over itself um, or the opposite of itself, they always have the, this split that wherever the um, vertex is of the absolute value function. So watch. We are approaching five from the left. By the way, right now, well, let's go take a look at it. So the absolute value of x minus five has its split at five, right? So to the right of five, it's always positive. To the left of five, it's going to be negative. I'm approaching from the left. So this is going to actually be the limit as x approaches five from the left of the opposite of x minus five over x minus five. Cancel, cancel, it's negative one. That's all that's left is negative one. You might say, well, why is the limit of negative one negative one? Because remember, when we have just a function y equals negative one, and I say, what's its limit as you come in from any direction? It's going to be negative one. So um, let me erase that. All right. So that seems more complicated than it actually is, because what I usually tell kids is once you get it isolated down to this absolute value of something over itself, just be a creeper, because it has to be one or negative one. So you really don't have to go to this notation. Theoretically, that's what's happening. But I always just say, hey, you know, get to the left of five. Pick a three. When you put in a three here for x, is it positive one or negative one? Well, it's negative. So it's almost easier just to kind of numerically creep up on it. So this guy, let's go down one over here to this one. So notice my answer is either one or negative one. Now let's use my shortcut way because I have the absolute, I have it all isolated as the absolute value of something over itself. It's got to be one. 2x minus one over 2x minus one is one. And the only thing that absolute value can be is the opposite of itself. So you don't even really need to write it as a piecewise function. Just head to the right of a half, maybe pick four, plug it in, and you'll notice I get one. So this is one. What the graph of it looks like though is this. At one half, I have an undefined value, but Anywhere to the right of a half, if I plug numbers in, they give me a one. To the left of a half, let's try it, let's try zero. I'd have zero minus one in absolute value over, do you see how I'm getting negative one there? So the graph of it looks like this. Whoops, my uh, open dot isn't quite where it ought to be, there we go. Boom, and we were coming in from the right, and from the right, we're up at one. So just recognizing this as one or negative one is awesome. Uh, if we were coming in from both directions, if it didn't have that plus on there, then it would be a D and E. All right, so I'm gonna go do the bottom one next here. We have um, a limit x approaching negative three from the left 
first thing I'll do is I'm going to take that one fourth and pull it out front. Constants can come out front of limits. Um, we'll deal with that on the next page, but I, I'm going to have you Actually, I won't have you pull it out front yet because I technically haven't taught you why it can come out front. So I think what I'm going to do is just go over here and say, well, I've got this negative here, right? I'm coming in at negative three from the left. This absolute value of something over itself is either one or negative one. I would just be a creeper. I'd come in at negative three from the left of it, okay? Think of what's to the left of negative three. Um, let's try negative four. When I plug it in, I end up getting absolute value. Again, I'm plugging in a negative four right here because I'm going to the left of three. I end up getting absolute value, absolute value of negative one over, and again, I'm plugging in a negative four. Boom, and I got a negative one. So this is always going to cancel to equal a negative one right? When I'm to the left of three, you could try and put a negative 10 and it doesn't really matter. It's either one or negative one. So get to the left, put in your favorite number to the left in. And then on the bottom, I have that four. So when I'm all done, I end up with a negative, negative one over four. So I get a one fourth. Lastly, I love this one up here. Okay. So I don't see that uh, absolute value of something um, and itself, but the top factors. So I will factor, limit x. By the way, I should do direct substitution on all these first. I hope you trust me that you would get a zero over zero. So um, we've got x approaching three from the right-hand side. We have a negative. We have a two x and an x, and it will become a, what would we need? Minus three and a plus one, is that right if I foil that? Uh, yep, I factored that correctly. So the negative came out front, I factored that trinomial. On the bottom, I have the absolute value of three minus x. Well, this right here is either going to be one or negative one. Try a five. I would get two on the top, I would get the absolute value of negative two on the bottom. So I'd get two over two, which is one. If you don't trust it, try another number to the right of three. Try a 10. You'd get a seven on the top over the absolute value of a negative seven on the bottom. Seven over seven is one. So this cancels to give you a one. Again, whenever you see these absolute value bars of stuff and then itself, or it could be the opposite of itself too, because opposites cancel to make one. So it could be like a three minus two X here and a two X minus three down here. As we take the limit, as we approach the vertex, it's going to be one or negative one. And you, I would just be a creeper to figure it out. So when I'm all done and I replug this in, I'll have the negative of um, six plus one, which gives me a negative seven. All right, so that was page 20 and a half. <laughs> I added that myself. So this page is just the properties of limits and then we're done. And limits are the easiest. To, we, the calculus really only has three um, main fields of study, limits, derivatives, which are my favorite, and integrals. And they all have properties for adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, um, all that stuff. But the limits actually have the easiest of the properties, which is kind of nice because the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. So it just means if you have a sum, you can do them each separately. You can just do the limit as x approaches a. I always tell kids limits are malleable, actually. Whatever you want to do with them, you usually kind of can. It's not the same with our other two things. Same here, the limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. So if you're subtracting two functions, you can just uh, do the limit of one of them and then the other one and subtract them separately. So that's really nice. Same uh, with quotients. The quotient of a limit is the limit of the quotient. So or the limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits. So I can just do the limit of the top over the limit of the bottom. And they're so easy, I almost feel like I don't need to cover them, but I do because 
because of what's coming, <laughs> right? So same here with multiplying. I can just break it into two multiplications. Constants can always come out front. So for example, if you were doing the limit as x approaches a of five e to the x, the constant can always come out front of the limit. So you can always pull any constant out front. Okay. Um, also, the limit of something to a power, you can actually say it's f of x to the limit as x approaches a. Um, to the p. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Now that one, it, here, let me show you what I mean, because sometimes when we have these in all this notation, here's what it's saying. Suppose we did the limit as x approaches a of 2x to the third. And let's suppose x is approaching 1. Direct substitution gives us 2. 2 to the third is 8, right? What this property says is you can do the limit of 2 to the x, just 2, and then cube it. <laughs> so the property looks weird. And the limit as we approach a of any constant is always 0. Because remember, the argument in here is always the f of x or the y equals. So if f of x is equal to 3, right, my limit as x approaches 7 of f of x, which is 3, will equal. Well, this is a horizontal line. 1, 2, 3. Boom. And as I approach 7 from both directions, it doesn't matter. As I approach any constant from both directions, and I'm on a horizontal line, the limit will be the height of that line. It will always be up at 3. So what is the limit as x approaches 1,000 of 9? Well, y equals 9 is your function. f of x equals 9. It's a horizontal line. So I'm up at 9 everywhere. So my limit is 9. So um, sorry, why did I put 0? <laughs> I was thinking derivative. So your limit is c. You're up there at c. All right. So that's it. Wow, that was a lot, right? Um, Oh, there's still more. All right, um, I'll do a couple of these. So when we use these properties, it says use the properties of limits. So what you're going to do is you're going to come in at 2 from the left on f of x, and then you're going to come in 2 to the right for g of x. When we do that, we have to hop on our graph of f. We have to approach 2 from the left, and we're up there at 3. Then we're going to go to g and we're going to approach two from the right, and we're up at six, so our limit is the sum of the limits, which is nine. Similarly, if you were to do this one, you would say, well, okay, I'm gonna make that a difference, but constants also come out front. So I do two limit x approaches negative one of f of x minus three limit x approaches negative one of g of x. You'd hop on the graph of f, you would approach negative 1 from both directions. So let's go up here. We're going to approach negative 1 from the right and from the left, and we're down here at, what is that, negative 6? So we'd have 2 times negative 6 minus 3 times. G of x when we approach negative 1 from both directions is negative 1. And then we deal with those. So again, these are really easy to work with. You bring the negative 2 out front, Limit x approaches 6 of f of x over limit x approaches 6 of g of x. It's intuitive. So all you're going to do is hop on f, approach 6 from both directions. All right, 6 from both directions. I'm at negative 4. So this would equal negative 2 times negative 4 over because the negative 2 was there originally. Um, the bottom, I'd approach g of x from both directions of 6 it was. So here's 6. Going from both directions, it looks like I'm up at 6. All right, so, and then you clean up that fraction. All right, 
So pretty straightforward. I'm not going to do the rest of these. I think you got it, right? I hope. It's really easy. It's, it's what you would think. So that's the last of it. Whew. That's a lot of notes for one section. Uh, thank you for gutting it out. I rarely give this long of notes, but when I do, you won't have notes the next day. So tomorrow is just going to be a, a work day for you. So have a good one. Um, over and out.